No clue. Hey, how you doing? This is Kitch, and you are watching me play Factorio. It's been a while, but uh, welcome back to the On Rails base. This is a base that I started several months ago, uh, back in Dot 18. It's heavily reliant on the train network as well as the circuit network in order to make it function, and uh, things were going pretty well uh, until I took my little break and then completely forgot what was going on inside this base. And I'm sure many of you have forgotten what's gone on inside this base as well. And, uh, some of you may be completely new to the series or circuit networks in general, and, uh, really have no idea what you're looking at right now. Uh, so yeah, I thought it would be good, uh, as I mentioned in the intro, to just kind of do a, a brief little circuit network review, uh, maybe a couple of episodes, just uh, starting with the basics and kind of tailoring it going toward the circuits that are used in this base, um, and also highlighting some of the changes that have occurred in the last several versions of Factorio that we may want to apply to the networks that we have in this base. Everything seems to be working okay uh, through the 1.0 and 1.1 releases, so I'm, I'm pleased with that. But there's a number of new features that have been added that we can apply to our base just to make it work a little bit better. Um, so, let's go ahead and I will defer to Kitch in the past and uh, let's review some circuit networks. So, let's start with the basics. The circuit network in Factorio is a feature that allows you to connect up specific entities together into networks. Once an entity is a part of one of these networks, it can generate, manipulate, and respond to signal values that travel across this network. This gives you a ton of control over these entities' behavior and allows you to create some practical and impractical subsystems inside your factory. So let's create a small, simple network and we will generate some simple signals. To create a circuit network, you need two or more entities, which are represented by this wooden chest and this power pole, and we will need some red or green wire. I think I'm going to go with green. It totally doesn't matter until it does matter. Uh, we'll get into that later. Uh, to create a network, we take our wire, we click on one entity, and then we'll notice that we've kind of got a wire that's following our mouse cursor around. Uh, then we click on the second entity, and that'll give that nice little sound, letting you know that these two are now connected together, and we have a circuit network. You'll notice that the sprite has changed. We now have a little yellow box with a little blue light on it, uh, letting us know that that is connected. And if we actually click on the chest and open it up, we'll notice we have a new menu that shows up here on the side when it's connected to a network. It'll tell us what network we're connected to, number 792, okay? As well as a mode of operations. Now the wooden chest doesn't have a lot of options, but some of the other entities have a lot more. Really the only thing we can do is read the contents. So we are currently reading the contents of this chest, which is currently 100 wood, and we are sending that out as a signal onto the green network. Now, power poles are a integral part of the circuit network. Uh, you can use them to carry signal wires across, but also one of their most handy features is you can mouse over them. And if you look at the menu over on the right, it will let you know what signals are currently traveling through that power pole. So under the signals area, we see we have a signal of 100 wood traveling on the green network. So what is happening is that this chest is reading its contents and sending that out onto the green network and we get that 100 signal as we would expect. If we add more wood to the chest, we can look and now we see 300 wood. If we take all the wood out, we get nothing. If we add some wood and some fish, we now get a signal of 400 fish and 300 wood that are traveling out on that network. 
Circuit networks that are not connected are independent. So if we look over here on the left, we have three wooden chests, each one with 100 wood. And if we look at our power poles here to see the output, we see that we have 100 wood here, 100 wood here, and then 100 wood here on a red signal since we're actually using a red wire. Now, if we were to connect these two power poles, this connects these two green networks together. Now they form one network. So if we look at our power pole now, we see we have a signal of 200 wood, uh, 100 coming from this chest and 100 coming from this chest. They add together to form one network. Now, the different wire colors act as separate networks. So even if we were to take this green wire and hook it up to this power pole, when we read it, we still have our 200 signal from the green network and our 100 signal from the red network. They don't combine together because they are different colors. But one thing we could do is connect up this chest to this chest, making it part of the green network as well. So if we look at our power pole now, we have 300 on the green network since all three of these chests are connected to the green network. But we still only have 100 on the red since this chest is the only one connected to the red network. Now, chests aren't the only items that can generate signals to throw out onto the network. Uh, here we have all of our belts hooked up to a red network and all of our inserters hooked up to a green network. These little belt readers that you see right here, those aren't special items. Uh, they just show up whenever you take a wire and connect it up to a belt. That's how you get those to show up. Uh, but if we click on our belt, we can see that in over here in our circuit connection menu, we have it set to read the belt contents, basically read what's underneath that part in that segment of belt and send that out as a hold. So that means that as long as there's an item in that belt seg segment, it's going to send that out. We can also set it to pulse where it just pulses once whenever an item comes across, which is useful for counting. Uh, something we'll use later, but right now it's just set to hold. And the same on the inserters, I have them set to read their hand contents, basically read whatever you currently have in your hand and send that out as a hold on the network. So if we look over here at our power pole, our red network is giving us the amount of fish that are currently on a belt. And the green network is giving us the amount of fish that are currently in the hands of the inserters. Of course, generating signals is not the only thing we can do with a circuit network. Several entities can respond to certain values that they read off of the circuit network. So over here, we have a rather simple network where this chest is currently hooked up to this inserter. If we click on our inserter here, we can see that it's set to enable disable itself, and it will do so whenever the raw fish signal is less than 20. So our chest is sending its contents out to the network. This inserter is going to read that, and whenever it's less than 20, it's going to enable itself. You can currently see this red light, which means it's off. Let's go ahead and pull the fish out. And you see it kicks back on and fills up the chest till it gets over 20, and then it stops. Now you see we have 21 in here. That's actually a function of our stack size. Uh, since it's currently defaulted to three if we override that and set it to a value that is a multiple of our target in this case 20 two would work uh, We can pull those items out and it should fill up to exactly 20 And it did uh, Now this isn't the only way to limit a chest we can of course limit a chest uh, You know using the old-fashioned way just by blocking off certain spots, but the, using the circuit network gives us a couple of advantages. Uh, one, with this, you're limited to the stack size, so we can only possibly limit it to 100, not 20 like we currently have. And also, you know, sometimes you just have some extra junk in your inventory and you want to go drop it off. Uh, and if your chest is blocked off, you can't do that. You have to do the whole maneuver where you do this and then do this and then set it back. Um, if we're using the circuit network, we can just keep it open. Uh, we can drop off our junk fish in here and then move on, go about our way. And this chest will stay full until it empties out. And then once it does, our inserter is going to kick back on and fill it up to the target amount that we want. So another common and somewhat practical use of these simple circuits is with maintaining buffers for your fluid system. 
Up here, we have a tank that is currently holding heavy oil. Uh, we have a lubricant chemical plant down here that's currently manufacturing lubricant. Uh, that's being fed from our refining system. And then we have a pump set up here to pump off excess heavy oil to be cracked down into light oil. At least that's what we're going to pretend. Um, this pump is set up to only be enabled when there is more than 3K uh, heavy oil inside this tank. So if there's less than 3,000, this pump is going to shut off, essentially shutting off our cracking, leaving the heavy oil to be made by our lubricant maker. So if we were to shut off the supply, um, it's going to go down to 3K, and then this pump's going to stop, and it's all going to be dedicated to making lubricant, which arguably is uh, possibly more important in our factory than cracking down the light oil. And it's going to maintain off until we get our supply back and we get more than 3,000 in this tank. Um, it's going to do a little bit of on-off, on-off, and that's kind of dealing with the threshold of going above and below 3K until it finally stabilizes, which it does. Uh, we'll, we'll look at some ways to address that here in the future. Another practical use of these simple circuits that you may have seen before is setting up alarms with programmable speakers. This is an item that you can create, and you can set a circuit condition on that, in this case, I'm saying that if I have less than 200 fish, go ahead and sound the alarm. And that's currently hooked up to this chest, which currently has 300. So if we take the fish out, we get an alarm going to let, let us know that we have a little bit of a fish shortage. Um, you can also see these hooked up to belts, like coal belts feeding your power plant. Whenever that belt is dry, we want to sound an alarm. And uh, I use it quite often for uranium-235. Whenever uh, I'll set a chest and say if I have greater than 40 to go ahead and play an alarm so I know that it's time to set up Covarex or that I have enough to get that started. So up to this point, we've covered some ways to generate signals and send them out on the circuit network. We've covered ways to read and respond to signals coming off of the circuit network. The only thing left to cover is how to manipulate signals on the circuit network. So we're two thirds of the way there. We're almost done. Pretty easy so far, right? Uh, when we talk about signal manipulation, we are mostly getting into factorio combinators. There are three types of combinators. We have the decider combinator, the arithmetic combinator, and the constant combinator. The constant combinator is more of a signal generation tool. Uh, we'll cover it a little bit later and instead focus on the decider and the arithmetic combinator. Now, these entities are a little bit different than some of the other items you can connect up to the circuit network. Um, one, they perform operations, uh, but two, they're actually two tiles wide and allow for two different connections. If we mouse over one of these combinators or go into alt mode, uh, you can see some arrows. We have an arrow pointing into the combinator and an arrow pointing out. These represent the input side and the output side. So we can make two connections, one to the input and one to the output. So let's hook up this chest to the input of the arithmetic combinator just like that. And then we want to take the output and hook that up to this power pole. You want to be really careful that you're connecting to the input and the output because it is possible to accidentally do something like this and think you're connecting to the output, but you're really not. You're actually connecting to the input post. It's very possible. I know I've seen me do it. So um, since we've got our arithmetic combinator hooked up here, let's go ahead and focus on it first. We'll take the decider out of the way. Uh, the arithmetic combinator is used to do a mathematical operation on a signal value coming in. So over here on the left, you can see we have a chest of 100 wood that is currently coming into the combinator. And then we're going to do some operation on that and send that result out on this green wire. So let's go ahead and open up the combinator and see what we have to do in order to get this done. All right, so the first thing we need to do is decide what signal we're actually going to perform this on, and we do that with this input box right here. We're going to go ahead and click on that, and then we get pretty much all of the items we currently have in Factorio, plus a page of generic signals as well as some special signals that we'll cover a little bit later. Uh, but we're currently reading wood out, so that's the one I'm interested in. Let's go ahead and find wood. We'll go ahead and select that. That's the signal we want to do the operation on. Then we need to decide what operation we want to do. We have a number of those available to us. Uh, the top one here, the asterisk, that is a multiply signal. So we're going to multiply this by uh, some value. We can select another signal coming in to multiply that by, or we can do a constant. Let's do a constant. Let's just say, let's multiply 
that value by two. Uh, so that's the operation we're going to perform. We're going to take the wood signal, multiply it by two, and then we need to decide what we need to want to do with that result after we've calculated it. We can send that out as a signal. We can send it out as any signal we want, but just to make things a little bit more sensical, let's go ahead and just send it out as a wood signal. So we're taking the wood signal, multiplying it by two, and then sending that out as a wood signal. So let's take a look at what that looks like here. We're getting a signal of 100 coming in. That's going through, and we're getting a signal of 200 coming out, which is what we expect. That's 100 times 2. Um, if we put some more wood in here, let's say we put 300, we get 600. So we're just multiplying that. If we do something like put fish in here, um, we're going to get nothing because we're only performing this operation on the wood signal currently, uh, which is something we'll cover a little bit later. We do have a number of operations available to us with the arithmetic combinator. We can do multiply, of course, but we can also divide, add, subtract, do the modulus or the exponent. And we also have a number of bit operations we can do, which is something I've never really delved in in Factorio, though there are some really interesting applications you can do as far as compression and combining signals into a sing single signal with these operators, uh, something that we will hold for a future day. There are also some special options available that make life with arithmetic combinators just a little bit easier. So taking the example we had earlier, where we're just taking an input and multiplying it by two, um, it worked really well with one, but let's say we had three signals coming in. We had fish, wood, and stone brick. We could set up something like this, where we individually take out each signal, uh, multiply it by two, and then send it on. And that does give us the correct answer. That does give us what we want. Uh, but there's also a shortcut we can do for situations like this. If we take a look down at this combinator um, and we select our signal and go to the signals tab, we have a special operator here called each, a special signal coming in called each. Now what that does is it will take each signal separately, perform that operation on it, and then I also have it as the output. So we're each signal coming in, we're going to multiply it by two and we're going to output each signal. So that does the same thing as this up here with one combinator. We're going to take each one of these signals coming in, we're going to multiply it by two, and then we're going to output each signal, giving us the exact same result. The decider combinator works in a very similar fashion to the arithmetic combinator, but instead of mathematical operations, we're dealing with logical operations. If we take a look at what's going on here, um, I'm sending in a signal of 200 fish, and I'm looking at that signal and saying that if it's greater than 100, to go ahead and send an output of the input count of those fish. So since 200 is greater than 100, I would expect an input count of 200 coming out on the line. Now, if we take half of those fish out, uh, 100 is no longer greater than 100. Uh, 100 is equal to 100, not greater than. So we don't get anything out here on the line. Um, if we throw in multiple fish, we're getting an input signal of 679. That one goes on out. So it's a, it's a logical condition that we can put on our circuit network. The logistic combinator gives us some operators that are a little bit more straightforward. We have the greater than, the less than, the equal to, the greater than or equal to, the less than or equal to, and the not equal to. Each uh, give us the option of sending out either a one or the input count whenever that condition evaluates to true. With the decider combinator, we also have a number of special signals that we can use when dealing with our logic. Uh, very similar to the arithmetic combinator, we do have the each signal. So this says for each signal coming in, if it's greater than 50, go ahead and output each at an input count. Uh, you can see we're getting stone bricks and wood because uh, those two items are the only one that's greater than 50. We only have 50 fish, so that one doesn't pass through. Uh, we also have the anything, which is the green symbol, and the everything symbol, which is the red signal. Um, anything means that if any input coming in meets that condition, evaluate to true, while the everything means that all signals coming in must evaluate to true for this to be true. 
Uh, so you can see down here, if anything is greater than 50, go ahead and output just one, just a yes, that's, that's true of every signal coming out. And you can see we are getting stone brick, wood, and fish, even though uh, the stone brick is the only one that actually meets that condition. One of them does, so the anything fires is true, and everything coming through passes through. Now, down here with everything, we're wanting everything to be greater than 50. It is not evaluating to true because the fish signal is only 25. So since everything is not greater than 50, nothing is coming through. If we go through and add some more fish here, that makes all the signals uh, be greater than 50, and then it will go through. Um, one of the newer additions that was added just a couple of versions ago in Factorio is the ability to set an output of anything as well. Um, I know a number of people were really happy that this was put in. I have yet to see the usefulness of it uh, because it only outputs one signal and it doesn't really matter. It, it follows the same logic of the item ID, so your top one's only going to go. Uh, just to kind of give you an example, I, th this is probably confusing for people, but for some people that understand this, maybe you can make me understand the utility of it. So even if the stone brick doesn't evaluate to true, it's still going to, it's only going to send one signal out, but it's going to be sorted by the item ID. So the fish will never come out if the wood is true. I, I don't know. I guess there's a use for it somewhere. Uh, but anyway, with special signals, uh, there are a couple of conditions that you just want to look out for when you're dealing with anything and everything. And that is what they evaluate to whenever the signal is nothing coming in. So we've got two empty chests here. And we'll notice that the anything greater than 50, I have it sending out a green signal if it's equal to true. We don't get anything there because well, there's nothing. Any, nothing is greater than 50. However, with everything... It does evaluate to true when there's nothing in here. And it tells you right on the tool tip, it is true when there are no inputs. And sometimes I'll read that and it makes total sense to me. And sometimes I'll read that and it doesn't make sense to me. I won't lie. It's a little bit on the don't make sense to me right now, but I'm sure there'll be a day when that will make, uh, make a lot more sense to me. It's, it, it's logical stuff dealing with null can sometimes be a little bit crazy. Uh, but just be aware of those. Just be aware of that behavior because sometimes it can bite you if you're not expecting it. And finally, we have the last combinator, which is the constant combinator. And all it does is sends out a constant signal onto the network. So you can see here we're outputting 100 fish. And if we look out on our network, we see a signal of 100 fish. We can send out any signal we want at any quantity. So if we wanted to send out, uh, let's send out 100,000 shotguns. Uh, we get that signal out on the network, 100K shotguns out on the network. It also has a on-off switch, which makes it sort of useful as kind of a on-off switch for your circuits that you set up. And it also has a lot of other applications. But one of the reasons why I really like to bring it up is that up until this point, the signals that we see on the network are always tied back to physical objects, either objects in chests or objects that are being held by an inserter, uh, objects in tanks. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the case. The, the circuit network isn't dealing with physical objects. It's only dealing with signals. There's no tie to the physical world, even though we're reading those. Those, those physical objects get converted to signals, and we're only dealing with the signals, if that makes sense. I, I, I've seen some questions in the past where people have been confused by that, so it's just something I want to clarify. doesn't have to tie into a physical object. We're only dealing with signals. Now, I am aware that the curve of this episode kind of started out on the simple side and then jumped up rather quickly to the complex as we entered in all the combinator nonsense. I am aware of that, but I want to bring that curve back down as we go ahead and wrap this episode up. Whenever I'm dealing with combinators, in particular in the On Rails series, I'm usually only dealing with one of three operations. You'll see these in 99% of the combinators that I am utilizing. Uh, one, we have a decider combinator. For each signal coming in, if it's greater than zero, then just output one of it. Uh, one of each signal coming in. So if you're getting a signal, output a one of it. Pretty straightforward, right? Uh, down here, we have this arithmetic combinator that says for each signal coming in, we're going to add zero to it 
and then output it. So we're technically doing nothing to it. Pretty straightforward. And uh, then we have this one over here that's taking each signal and multiplying it by a negative one and then outputting it. So we're taking the input, making it negative, and sending it out. Now, all these operations are pretty simple and uh, don't really seem like, at least at face value, that they're really doing a whole lot. But once you get into combinators and kind of their properties and some of the, the, the advanced systems that you can create, a lot of these will start to make more sense. And we'll, we'll work on that in the next episode. Now, I know what you're thinking. Something is different, something has changed. And yes, you are correct. That nuclear reactor that you saw in the map mode at the beginning of the video, where did that come from? As I was dusting off the cobwebs off of my recording equipment, I did come across a lost episode of the On Rails series. Uh, so I'll be posting that to the channel here very soon. So don't be surprised when you see it, uh, when you see an episode from Kitch six months ago. Uh, you have not traveled back in time. Uh, everything is okay. It's just a really, really old episode that I'm going to be posting just for completeness as we get into the series. So uh, that explains that. Uh, you're not going crazy on any level. You're fine. And uh, these circles, these circles have always been here. Always been here. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Have a good one.